Hello everyone, in this video we'll understand 10 principles of economics. The first principle is people face trade-offs. You may have heard the old saying, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch, which means that there is nothing free in this world. To get one thing that we like, we usually have to give up another thing that we like. Making decisions requires trading off one goal against another. Let's look at some examples. Consider a student who must decide how to allocate her most valuable resource, her time. She can spend all her time studying economics, spend all of it studying statistics, or divide it between the two fields. For every hour she studies one subject, she gives up an hour she could have used studying the other. And for every hour she spends studying, she gives up an hour she could have spent napping, watching TV, or playing guitar. When people are grouped into societies, they face different kinds of trade-offs. One classic trade-off is between butter and guns. The more a society spends on national defense, the less it can spend on consumer goods. Another trade-off is between efficiency and equality. Efficiency means that society is getting the maximum benefits from its scarce resources, Whereas equality means that those benefits are distributed uniformly among society's members. Efficiency refers to the size of the economic pie and equality refers to how the pie is divided into individual slices. So when government make decisions, it is always that these two goals are into conflict. When the government redistributes income from the rich to the poor, it reduces the reward for working hard. As a result, people work less and produce fewer goods and services. In other words, when the government tries to cut the economic pie into more equal slices, the pie gets smaller. The second principle is, the cost of something is what you give up to get it. Because people face trade-offs, making decisions requires comparing the cost and benefits of alternative courses of action. Now consider the decision to go to school. The largest cost of going to school is your time. When you spend a year listening to lectures, reading textbooks and writing papers, you cannot spend that time working at a job. College athletes who can earn millions if they drop out of school and play professional sports are well aware that their opportunity cost of college is very high. Now what is an opportunity cost? An opportunity cost is what you give up to get that item. For example, if you are at the ice cream parlor, you have to decide between two flavors, chocolate and strawberry. When you choose chocolate, the opportunity cost is the enjoyment of the strawberry that you have given up to get the chocolate flavor. This is what we call as an opportunity cost. That is, whatever we are giving up to get that item is opportunity cost. The third principle is rational people think at the margin. In economics, it is normally assumed that people are usually rational. Rational people systematically and purposefully do the best they can to achieve their objectives given the available opportunities. And they always think at margin. Okay, so marginal change. What is a marginal change? A small incremental adjustment to an existing plan of action. For example, when exams roll around, your decision is not between blowing them off or studying 24 hours a day, but whether to spend an extra hour revising your notes instead of watching TV. So this is where the concept of marginal change comes into play. Every rational person make decisions by comparing marginal benefits and marginal cost. Right? So for example, there is an airplane having 200 seats and average cost of each seat is rupees 500. One might be tempted to conclude that the airline should never sell a ticket for less than 500 rupees. But actually, a rational airline can often find ways to raise its profits by thinking at the margin. Imagine that a plane is about to take off with 10 empty seats and a standby passenger waiting at the gate will pay only Rs. 300 for a seat. 
Should the airline sell the ticket for Rs 300 which is actually less than the average cost of that seat? Of course it should. If the plane has empty seats, the cost of adding one more passenger is tiny. Although the average cost of flying a passenger is 500, the marginal cost is merely the cost of the bag of peanuts he purchases and, uh, and the cost of water or soda that the extra passenger will consume. As long as the standby passenger pays more than the marginal cost, selling the ticket is profitable. Another thing is, why is water so cheap while diamonds are so expensive? Humans need water to survive while diamonds are unnecessary. But for some reason, people are willing to pay much more for a diamond than for a cup of water. The reason is that a person's willingness to pay for a good is based on the marginal benefit that an extra unit of the good would yield. The marginal benefit in turn depends on how many units a person already has. Water is essential but the marginal benefit of an extra cup is small because water is plentiful. By contrast, no one needs diamonds to survive but because diamonds are so rare, people consider the marginal benefit of an extra diamond to be large. So with the concept of marginal benefit and marginal cost, we can explain why airlines are willing to sell a ticket below average cost and why is water so cheap while diamonds are so expensive. The fourth principle is people respond to incentives. An incentive is something that induces a person to act such as the prospect of a punishment or a reward. For example, what is an incentive? Why you go to school on time? Because you know there is something that induces you to go to school at time because you know that if you will be late, you will be punished. And that punishment as an incentive works for you. Similarly, incentives are crucial to analyzing how markets work. For example, when the price of an apple rises, people decide to eat fewer apples. Of course, as a consumer, we will consume less apples if they become costlier. At the same time, apple orchards decide to hire more workers and harvest more apples. So of course, the producers or the sellers of the apples will try to produce more apples and sell it more in the market because they know the prices are higher. So this is how incentives work. Then trade can make everyone better off. Trade between two countries can make each country better off. It allows each person to specialize in the activities he or she does best. By trading with others, people can buy a greater variety of goods and services at lower cost. Trade allows countries to specialize in what they do best and to enjoy a greater variety of goods and services. Sixth principle is Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Before exploring the concept of market economy, let's understand what is central planning. So central planning is when the government organizes economic activity in a way that promotes economic well-being for the country as a whole. But most countries that once had centrally planned economies have abandoned the system and are instead developing market economies. In a market economy, the decisions of a central planner are replaced by the decisions of millions of firms and households. Right? In a market economy, no one is looking out for the economic well-being of society as a whole. Free markets contain many buyers and sellers of numerous goods and services and all of them are interested primarily in their own well-being. Yet, despite these de decentralized decision-making and self-interested decision-makers, market economies have proven remarkably successful in organizing economic activity to promote overall economic well-being. According to Adam Smith, invisible hands coordinate the decisions of households and firms that make up the economy. It also explains why taxes adversely affect the allocation of resources for they distort prices and thus the decisions of households and firms. It also explains the great harm caused by policies that directly control prices such as rent control. And it explains the failure of communism. In communist countries, prices were not determined in the marketplace but were dictated by central planners. 
These planners lack the necessary information about consumer's taste and producer's cost, which in a market economy is reflected in prices. Central planners failed because they tried to run the economy with one hand tied bit behind their backs, the invisible hand of the marketplace. Now, seventh principle is governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. Now, the question comes if the invisible hand of the market is so great, why do we need government? So, one reason we need government is that the invisible hand can work its magic only if the government enforces the rules and maintains the institutions that are key to a market economy. Market economies need institutions to enforce property rights so individuals can own and control scarce resources. A farmer won't grow food if he expects his crops to be sort of stolen. A restaurant won't serve meals unless it is assumed that consumers will pay before they leave. We all rely on government provided police, uh, police and courts to enforce our rights over the things we produce and the invisible hand counts on our ability to enforce our rights. So the invisible hand is powerful but it is not omnipotent. Right. So there is an another reason we need government. There are two broad reasons for a government to intervene in the economy and change the allocation of resources that people would choose on their own to promote efficiency and to promote equality. Now first, the goal of efficiency. Economists use the term market failure to refer to a situation in which the market on its own fails to produce an efficient allocation of resources. One possible cause of market failure is an externality, which is the impact of one person's actions on the well-being of a bystander. The classic example of an externality is pollution. Right. Another possible cause of market failure is market power, which refers to the ability of a single person or a firm to unduly influence market prices. For example, if everyone in town needs water but there is only one well, the owner of the well is not subject to any competition with which the invisible hand normally keeps self-interest in check. In the presence of externalities or market power, well-designed public policy can enhance economic efficiency. Right. Now the goal of equality. Even when the invisible hand is yielding efficient outcomes, it can never, never work towards the disparities in economic well-being. A market economy rewards people according to their ability to produce things that other people are willing to pay for. The invisible hand does not ensure that everyone has sufficient food, decent clothing and adequate health care. This inequality may, depending on one's political philosophy, call for government intervention. Many public policies such as income tax and the welfare system aim to achieve a more equal distribution of economic well-being. To say that the government can improve on market outcomes at times does not mean that it always will. Public policy is made not by angels but by a political process that is far from perfect. Sometimes policies are designed simply to reward the politically powerful. Sometimes they are made by well-intentioned leaders who are not fully informed. So as we study economics, we will become a better judge of when a government policy is justifiable because it promotes efficiency or equality and when it is not. Then the eighth principle is a country's standard of living depends on its ability to produce goods and services. The differences in living standards around the world are staggering. Now why there are large differences in living standards among countries and over time? The answer is surprisingly simple. Almost all variation in living standards is attributable to differences in countries' productivity. Now, what is a productivity? The amount of goods and services produced from each unit of labor unit. In nations where workers can produce a larger quantity of goods and services per unit of time, most people enjoy a high standard of living. Ninth principle is, Prices rise when the government prints too much money. So, 
the concept of inflation comes in what is an inflation an increase in the overall level of prices in the economy what causes inflation one of the reasons is printing more money right this is because the money supply plays an important role in determining prices if there is more money chasing the same amount of goods then prices will rise and this becomes a reason for inflation now last principle is society faces a short run trade off between inflation and unemployment short run effects of monetary injections are increasing the amount of money in the economy stimulates the overall spending and thus the demand for goods and services higher demand may over time cause firms to raise their prices but in the meantime it also encourages them to hire more workers and produce a larger quantity of goods and services therefore there would be more hiring which means lower unemployment this debate heated up in the early years of barack obama's presidency in 2008 and 2009 the us economy as well as many other economies around the world experienced a deep economic downturn which is normally known as 2008 global economic crisis so the first major initiative was a stimulative package of reduced taxes and increased government spending at the same time the nation's central bank increased the supply of money the goal of these policies was to reduce unemployment although some feared that these policies might over time lead to an excessive level of inflation but in short run it is always understood that if there is inflation or if the prices are increasing the unemployment will reduce so thank you so much this was all about the 10 principles of economics given by mankyu and uh, if you like the video hit the like button and don't forget to subscribe this channel